An Ulti World subscription gets you closer to the players and personalities you care about with game video, in-depth written and video analysis. Uh, he's going to take off deep, but what he does is very simple. Documentary shorts. And we've played Fruit Squad before, and it, it just feels a little bit harder to lose this year. And a whole lot more. To get your subscription or learn more, go to ultiworld.com slash subscribe. Double wide coming off of a big win over to Boston Ironside, 15 to nine. Impressive stuff, especially in the second half from the Texas team. And Sockeye coming off of a loss. They were upset in the first round, 15 to 10 by Chicago Machine. I think a lot of people thought Machine maybe a little bit overrated coming into this tournament, but they started things off right with a huge win. And so Sockeye will look to get things back on track against the defending national champions, Austin Double Wide, here in this game. And Keith, let's talk about some of the keys to this game for both teams. Now we, we had the chance to watch Double Wide in their first game against Ironside and their disc movement around the handlers was just so good as we see them start out with lots of space, isolating their big athletes. They have so many big athletes downfield that they can scare you. And then they, their handlers have done a great job working the disc around. We also saw Kirk Gibson putting on a, a show on their defensive line. You see an early turnover from Double Wide after Will Driscoll floated a, a, a flick a little bit too high over his receiver's head. And so Sockeye will get a chance to get an early break here. Great strike cut up the line there from Sam Harkness. Harkness looking into the end zone, and it's a very quick score. Reed Koss coming down with it on the far sideline, and it's 1-0 here early. Sockeye taking advantage of the throwing error there by Will Driscoll. And the double wide O-line will have to get things uh, sort of reset here as they go out and try to put in their first point of the game. Very few of those kinds of mistakes in their first game for double wide. Most of their most of their turnovers were on, were on deep looks. They didn't tend to turn it over close to the disc. They played a very clean game. Uh, we'll see if they can bounce back from an early turnover and giving up an early break to a Sockeye team that we know is very mentally impressive. And if you give them the mental edge, they can really clamp down on you with their ability to play pressure defense and tire teams out with their disc movement. So we were talking before about some upsets. In the men's division, it's been just as exciting. Toronto's GOAT took down San Francisco Revolver, the three-time national champion. Of course, double wide winning last year, but Revolver winning the three times before that. And uh, Revolver's really, along with, you know, Sockeye has been the best team this year during the regular season. And GOAT takes down Revolver 15 to 12 in the first round. So we've got tons of exciting action. Shane Lightning winning against Ring of Fire um, and or excuse me Ring Ring taking down Chain in that first round so that's another upset as we watch Alex Thorne receive the pull here for Double Wide who gets it to Lost Corn yes, moving ahead here it's Natenberg Mike Natenberg gets 25-yard gainer to Kieran Thomas. Thomas going to step out and throw the backhand, looking for DiGirolamo, but DiGirolamo doesn't really attack the disc. And the defender gets out in front, making the play. Donnie Clark. Clark, a rookie on this team. When we saw this team at Terminus, he was playing very well, but there he's just able to work outwork DiGirolamo to get position. Moved ahead here. Little hammer, might flow too far, but no, it's handled. Eric Dozberg. Now it's on the sideline with Clark. Sakai content to work short throws underneath. Typical Seattle offense, the way that this team has been playing. And you hear them down on the sideline yelling small ball encouraging their teammates on the field to just take the easy short throws. I mean, this is a team that, that their style of play is well known. They're, they're very quick, and they use that to their advantage. Dozberg, not your small ball guy. He's your big man, but happy to work in that system. 
Ali Lennon. Comes back to Dozberg and now around. Good downfield defense from double wide so far on this possession. And we've got a call here as Deidre Olimo and Donnie Clark. A little contact. It's the temperature here in Davis is is feel it feels like it goes up a couple degrees every hour or so as we see a shot go up here to the sideline. Did he keep his toes in? Yes. Observer signals it was in, and they fired into the end zone, and very quickly it's two to nothing. Sockeye leading double wide, and double wide just looking a little bit sloppy here at the early part of this game. Uh, coming off of such a good half against Ironside, a little bit surprising to see. The reason I mentioned the heat, that was a long point. It, so it seems like this O-line is tired, and I, and I certainly expect a D-line, which is what we see coming out on the field here for double wide. Try and get them some momentum. Sockeye starting with two breaks, and they're loud and excited on their sideline. Double wide trying to find some energy here. Sockeye. Always good at taking advantage of other teams' mistakes. It's one of the reasons they've been such a great team for so long. Defensive line. So good at getting the disc and maintaining possession and punching in scores. They've had an up and down season so far. They went with a very small roster to the Pro Elite Challenge in Atlanta at Terminus. Mostly had good wins, had one bad loss to Pony. The Pony went on to win that tournament. Uh, but they had a very short roster, a lot of guys missing that tournament, including Danny Karlinski, Mario O'Brien, Phil Murray, Skip Sewell, and Matt Rader, all starters for this team. So we'll see some of those guys in action today. This pull goes up. Some of those guys, some of those guys are still missing. So, uh, you know, O'Brien on the sideline, uncleated. Murray on the sideline, uncleated. So we'll see with with these missing pieces. But we know Sockeye's played without them and seen success with them in those situations. So stall getting a little bit high, but Wolf gets rid of it. Now just moves ahead, Daniel Poindexter. Poindexter airing it out, looking for Wolf. It's going to be contested, and it's another end zone D on a floating huck from Sockeye. So they'll now have a chance to go up 3-0 here. Swing pass to the break side, connects. Wobbly high release, but gets rid of it. And it looks like there may have been an elbow to the face there. Jake Anderson going down as that high release went up from BJ Sefton. So observer, Mitch Dengler, one of the top observers in the game. So the disc will stay with Tyler Kinley as the contact was ruled to have happened sort of after the throw. So. Vertical stack set here from Seattle. And we're going to see a sub for Sockeye as well. They bring in Sam Harkness to add some offensive firepower to this D-line. Kinley gets rid of it. Kinley. Working hard here to, to continue to move this offense forward. And now Kinley putting it to the end zone, looking for Harkness. Harkness all alone, and he'll come down with it. It's three to nothing, Seattle Sockeye. And double wide in all kinds of early trouble here against the very dangerous Seattle team. 
a great shot there from Kinley. He was able to get the up line uh, and use that power position to, to put one way downfield. Two defenders in the area, but the throw too good. And we hear Sakai chanting, blood in the water, chug, chug, chug. They're going for the jugular. An early 3-0 lead here. They know that they could win this game early if they can go up and continue to, to hold the momentum that they're starting this game with. Double wide trying to figure out what do we have to do to reestablish our, our flow as their offensive line comes back out here. Thorne, Driscoll, Pollock, DeGirolamo, Lamasters, Naden Berg, and Jeff Loscorn. What we've seen early is a couple of forced hucks, and particularly on the throw to DiGirolamo, may have been a little bit lazy attacking the disc, thinking that he had the height advantage, but Seattle player using the, their body, using his body well to get in front and get the D. Clark, a guy who made his, a name for himself with the Seattle Rainmakers in the MLU, and has been having a very strong rookie season here for Seattle Sockeyes. Loscorn brings it down in center field. Comes ahead, Natenberg fakes. Great job on the mark to deny that hook look to Girolamo got separation. Here's Thorne. Thorne steps around and rips a backhand looking for Will Driscoll. It's gonna be contested, but Driscoll goes up over the top and brings it down. Putting Double Wide on the board. It's now three to one, and finally, Double Wide will get their defense out onto the field. That's, that's, I mean, that's ideal for a Double Wide, right? You, you get a couple of isolation looks, you get some deep puck looks, and eventually you take the one you want. They've got the height, they've got the guys you can win the battle in the air, so if the throws are good enough, they will be able to, to find success with that sort of matchup. Now their D-line will come out and we'll see if Kirk Gibson, Jared Wolf, and company can propel them to a break and bring them back, back into this game. Three to one the score. And Sakai looking to Bounce back after a little bit of a slow start against Machine. And behind us, on the women's showcase field, Seattle Riot down four to one against the Toronto Capitals. And so Riot having a very rough start to the tournament here after falling in the first game to showdown. And now struggling here early against Toronto. The Riot counterpart, Sakai, takes the pull now. Just moving nicely. Chris Kasednar gets it out to the sideline. Spencer Wallace here to the middle. Comes back to Wallace. And there's a foul called. Sockeye looking deep here. And a big D in the end zone. Impressive play downfield from Dan Emmons. Looked like that that disc was gonna come over the top and fall safely into the hands of the receiver who had a couple steps. But the height of Emmons allows him to get up and make the play. And now it'll be Kurt Gibson, who was so good against Ironside on their first round of pool play, bringing it to the line for this D-line offense. Dalton Smith, who's seen increased playing time since really playing well against George Stubbs in the first round, 
drawing back a, out there. Drawing a difficult matchup with Mike Caldwell. A long time stud from Sakai. Here's Rory Orloff. Dishes it back to Smith. Smith floats a flick, and it's going to float up and out of bounds. Kurt Gibson maybe calling a foul here, saying that there was contact over his back Case as he went up on the sideline to get it. Did look like Gibson had a play. Kasteen looked frustrated with the call. We'll see if the observer rules in their favor, but. And it's just going to be a contested foul call here. So it's going to go back to Smith. Caldwell on him. Smith getting a, a chance to redeem himself after making such a silly mechanical error. Smith moving it up ahead to Orloff on the far side. Cook all alone in the middle. Cook, one of the captains of this double wide team, and he's going to step around and put up a backhand, but there's really nobody in the area. Just uh, Caleb Denacor tried to run onto it, but uh, was behind both of the defenders. A high stall count. They weren't able to get away from the sideline, had it clumped up, and Smith with a big bid, but Caldwell pulls it in and maintains possession for Sakai. Kinley moves it out to the far side. Now getting open underneath. Kinley with such good footwork, finding ways to get open even against good defense from double wide. Now high stall on the sideline, but he'll throw the hammer and find the release valve. Again, it's Kinley. Dump back to Kinley on the near side. Sakai having trouble getting open downfield a little bit. Finding the swing space, however. Cook on the mark here. Cutters may be getting tired. Things are getting a little more stagnant, a little more clogged downfield. So we see a pick, usually a strong sign of clogging. You see on the field right now, very amorphous stack. Running a bit of a horizontal here, but. See, all the cutters are in almost the same half of the field. It's the same problem that plagued double wide on their last possession. Unable to use the width of the field, we'll see k Steen burns a timeout here. Yeah. Not liking the looks of things out there, so Castine calls a tee. And they'll talk about it as they look to get things straight. Sockeye leading double wide three to one. And exciting action here early at the Pro Flight Finale. One thing of note, today's games matter only for seeding. All of the competitors will be making the championship bracket tomorrow. Everybody goes to quarterfinals. So regardless of your performance today, you could still win the tournament. Uh, you can lose all three of your pool play games and your crossover, and you would come in as the four seed tomorrow, but it would have a chance to win out and win the tournament. So. We'll have to see if we see any effects of that in the way that teams play. Maybe resting guys, especially later in the day. It's, it is very it's hot today. It's getting hotter and hotter. We're into the 80s now, and we're expected to be up into the 90s by the end of the day. But it's beautiful weather, aside from the heat. Completely blue skies. There's not a cloud in sight. Sunny and a very light breeze, maybe three to five miles per hour. Seattle talking it over in the huddle. And Mitch Dengler, the observer, telling them just how much time they have left. So Seattle now setting. <laughs> and we see here on the near side, Mike Caldwell trying to run into position and was actually caught out of position and forced to come back away from the spot that he wanted to stand here on the rail. So no major effect, but Dengler is a stickler for the rules. Here's Wallace. 
Moves into the middle. Caldwell on the far side fakes the upline throw. Now coming around and into the front corner of the end zone. Punching it in. And it's Seattle taking a 4-1 lead. So whatever they talked about in the timeout work, they reset that offense, got their cutters spread out across the field, and it uh, looked like it got a job done for them. KC, nice heads up play there to recognize that the defender was not in the area, and he was able to milk the disc into the end zone to keep that from being a, another goal line possession and make it a score. Four to one the score, Sockeye leading double wide, up three breaks, opening the game with a 3-0 run. And double wide defense getting a turn on that last Sockeye offensive possession, but couldn't work it in for the score. So they'll have work to do in this game to get back into it. But the double wide offense back out on the field. Around the division, Toronto Goat leading Chain Lightning 5-3. to three. And keep you updated on scores as much as we can. Ring of Fire and Revolver tied up at 2-2. Two -two. And here's Thorne in the middle of the end zone with the disc for double wide. Good defense from Sakai here. Forces the swing across the back of the end zone. And now they finally get it out. It's Driscoll on his own goal line who finds Kieran Thomas. Yes, Sam. He floats it out to Lamasters. And recent pickup, Ethan Pollock, gets it ahead to Thorne. Now Thorne going to air it out to Thomas. It's not a good matchup for Thomas. And it will be a block, but I believe there is a foul called on the field. Thomas, very good in the air. It's discussion about perhaps whether or not the disc was knocked out of Thomas's hands. So it's going to the observer and the ruling that it is that it was a foul. So Thomas is going to get the disc on the goal line. Thomas, a huge part of this double wide offense. Just a guy who generates a lot of yardage for them, both under and away. Disc is tapped live, so double wide will get into their end zone set. Thomas taps it in. Dumps it back to Loscorn. And a drop. Kevin Christian, one of the rookies on this double wide team, simply drops it. It may have looked away before he'd secured the disc. And so it's Sakai with another chance for a break. Goal line just not the place to turn it over. Sakai working underneath here. Harkness. Harkness putting up a blady hammer. And it's going to be dropped. It's actually a really good throw. Came in over the top of Kevin Christian, but couldn't get handled. Barrett, yeah, unable to come up with that. Uh, maybe got caught in the sunlight. It was a very high throw. So now double wide's offense back with the disc. Here's Kieran Thomas. Thomas floating it out nicely into space for Thorne. Mismatch on the field. Somebody's poached. Thorne finds Driscoll. Not able to use the poach there. Lamaster's streaking in the end zone to try and find space, but now he's going to gain yardage out of it. Just Got five yards. Well now, Lamaster's gets to Loscorn. Now Driscoll, and he'll throw it into the end zone. And it'll be Christian making up for his drop with a nice low grab there on the side of the end zone. And it's now four to two. Pretty 
critical score there. Yeah, a 4 2 is a manageable deficit. 5 1, pretty dangerous, and that's a deep hole to dig out of. Able to work from goal line to goal line for the score there. And their O line could use some of that the confidence, the momentum of finding some success. And even that point, you know, that it could have been a lot cleaner. You know their double wide offensive unit's gonna have higher expectations for themselves than this performance would satisfy. So it's still a three break lead here for Seattle. Talking it over on the line. And a few players not cleated up here. You can see them in the red jerseys. Adam Simon in his street shoes on the sideline and Danny Karlinski who just talking to the offensive line. Not playing today. And some of the injuries coming off of the Major League Ultimate season, which many of these Sockeye players participated. That pull gonna go out of bounds. One of the few bricks we've seen today in this still weather, it's been pretty easy for players to put up big inbounds pulls. And that last Sockeye pull had double wide star in their possession in the middle of their end zone. So we've seen, we've seen that pulls can make a big difference in how a defensive point plays out. Here's Kassednar. Puts it in the middle of the field, and there's a big shot. Big bomb. Castine goes up and grabs it. Plenty of separation. Wide open Castine and Kurt Gibson in coverage. Head down after that one. Maybe thought he might be able to make up more ground than he was able to. It's a good throw from Ali Lennon. Score now five to two. Sockeye leading double wide. Casey and another guy who has struggled with injuries. He was a member of an MLU team, actually played with the DC Current, uh, but played as maybe a misnomer, spent pretty much all of the season uh, injured and unable to perform, was not playing with, the, with Sockeye at Terminus as well. So uh, his health is certainly worth monitoring because he can be an impact player when he's on the field. So we see him getting open on one of the best defensive players we might see all weekend in Kirk Gibson. So the score five to two. Sockeye offense holding after their defense gave them a sizable lead. A couple of scores from around the women's division. Caps and Seattle Riot tied at fives, while Nemesis looking to continue their undefeated streak through this season. It's up 6-4 against Atlanta Zozone. Last score we saw for the other teams in that pool, Molly Brown and Fury. Molly Brown down 3-4, to four. but it's been a couple minutes since we've gotten an update from that one. But. Lots of exciting action here at the Profile Finale in Davis, California. A lot of strong competition. All of the quarterfinalists from last year's club championships, part of the Pro Flight in the first year of the Triple Crown Tour. And this tournament was a big part of that, of that directive from the USAU, a chance to put the top teams in the same tournament at the very end of the year. Maybe even a preview of bracket play at the club championships this season. Christian looking a little tight out there. Another low throw. Thorne cleans it up. This is more of the double head offense we saw against Ironside working with that front triangle of thrower dump in front of the stack to work either to uplines or through full field swings. Lots of give and goes. That disc nearly blocked, but Driscoll comes down with it, and now he'll throw the hammer to a wide open Kieran Thomas after his defender poached. So nice smooth score there from double wide. And as you just pointed out, that triangle at the front has been working very well for them. They're able to get cuts both to the break side and up the line and move the disc quickly. And they wait to find those downfield looks and use their 
speed and height well and wisely, not just trying to put it up for 50-50s. Yeah, you will see them come down in some isolation sets to start start pull plays. Sometimes it's Girolamo out in space or Thomas, and they'll try and get him a deep shot early. Uh, but they're also happy to, to run that vertical stack and, and utilize that triangle in the front to advance the disc until they get an opening. Twice we've seen so far a up-the-line throw to space, which draws a downfield defender, but not able to make the play, and that leaves a poach downfield. This time they're able to capitalize. Last time they were unable to do so. Chicago Machine just got a break on Boston Ironside, and they lead 5-4. to four. Ring and Revolver locked at fours, and Goat up on Chain Lightning, 7-4. to four. Goat having a very good start to their tournament. Despite missing eight or nine players, we were talking to some of their players yesterday and don't have a full squad, but playing well with what they have. We're hearing that uh, Anatoly Vasiliev and Mark Lloyd really stepped up and, and been big for Goat and instrumental in, in their early successes here at the Pro 5 finale. Sockeye offense back to work. Going deep right away. And it's going to float a little bit too far. That throw just not coming out at the right angle, and Sewell not able to run it down. Just a little too much IO on it, and it never comes back to the receiver. So this will give Double Wide an opportunity to get back within one if they can work it the length of the field. Bump on the mark there, and I think we will have a foul call. Double Wide players have largely been letting that kind of contact go on the mark. That contact allowing Sewell to gain position on the mark and double wide not going to leave that one. Nearly a miscommunication between the two receivers and now it's a deep shot. Steven Darrow looking downfield for Michael Kramer. Kramer goes up just outside the end zone, standing on the goal line here, dumps it off and they will punch in the break. It's Jace, Jason Schaefer finding Roy Orloff in the end zone. Score now five to four. And that is just what the doctor ordered for double wide. Yeah, you remember, you remember this game was 4-1. Sakai had a chance to make it 5-1, a big difference. And you can see how, how much of a difference that's made as we're now at 4-5. And we're essentially back in a position where either team can win this game. Win expectancy percentage is just shifting as Double Wide's able to find some momentum, a key break there. Kurt Gibson with the disc, getting ready to pull here for Double Wide as we see Sakai talking on the line. 20 seconds as you watch Mitch Dengler put up two fists there that each fist stands for 10 seconds, so if you see the observers put up a hand like that, you know what that means. 10 seconds now. So the offense is signal readiness, and the defense has 20 seconds to pull. Gibson getting set. Pull is up. It's a good one. Floating down just in front of the end zone and Sakai's offense back underway. Score five to four. You're watching Ulti World's coverage of the Pro Flight Finale presented by Spin Ultimate. Disc moving ahead here. A junky look from double wide and it's not prevented Sakai from eating up yardage in short order. Wallace. Moves it up. Kinley now. And Sakai moving beautifully up the field. Uh, although it's going to come back here as we have pick call on the field. The double wide junk look 
almost making it easier for Sockeye to run their small ball. But it looks like the observer overruled the pick call, and so it's a score for Sockeye. Six to four now, so Seattle leading Austin. And double wide quiet on the sideline as they send their offense back onto the field. Yeah, they've, they've got to find some, some energy. I mean, we saw fairly, fairly flat sidelines in the first, first half of the first game. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see if maybe, you know, further into the day, if that's something that's going to change. Sakai has, has been able to find plenty of energy and had a noisy sideline, although that's pretty typical for them. 6-4, though. Sending their defense out, which I'm sure is what they want to do. And this double wide O-line will continue to search for some consistency and flow. Over in the women's division, Riot has gotten back on track and have tied the game up against Toronto. And in fact, they just took a lead. It's now 7-6, Riot leading the Capitals. And that's after a 4-1 lead for Toronto at the start of that game. So maybe Seattle starting to play in to form a little bit here in this hot weather here in Davis, California. Alex Dorn receiving the pull for double wide and centering the Lost Corn. Lost Corn steps around and throws a break backhand looking for Will Driscoll. Driscoll goes up and gets it about five yards outside the end zone. Doesn't have anybody. Stahl going to move high here. Thorn gets poached and Driscoll finally finds Lost Corn. Thorn gets it back to Driscoll. Driscoll, Scuber to Kieran Thomas. And great point there for Will Driscoll as double wide offense easily puts it in. Six to five now, Seattle still leads up a pair of breaks. Another nice shot there. When you, when you can get that outside in throw tailing towards the receiver, in, in some cases, it's going to go far enough that the defender doesn't even have a shot at it. But in other cases, you're, it's coming into your receiver. Your receiver has a chance to attack the disc, go up strong, while the defender is kind of fading with the disc, jumping backwards. It's just so much harder for them to attack the disc with the same kind of explosive leap. And it's something that helps Will Driscoll, who's particularly good at that. Made a, made, it's made a couple of nice grabs on similar throws. And that's helped double wide punch in some scores here. We hope you're enjoying today's coverage of the Pro Flight Finale here on Ulti World. And you're watching along with us right here on the dedicated tournament page with live updating Twitter feeds and score updates alongside your video. And we're going to keep you updated all day long, streams all afternoon. Coming up next at 1 p.m. Pacific is the matchup between DC Scandal and Seattle Riot. And it should be a great matchup, a rematch of a game at the US Open. And after that, we'll have the women's 1v1 crossover. So the pull, a little bit short this time from double wide. And Sakai moving the disc across the field. Burton moves it ahead to Kinley. A hard working cut from Burton to open the point to get them that yardage. Sednar gets open up the line. Moving it ahead here. And now into the end zone. And it's an easy score. Just working the small ball offense as they continue to emphasize on the sideline. Punching it in, no problem against this bigger bigger and more athletic double wide team perhaps, but not as quick so far in this game as Sakai has proven to be. Yeah, they just, Sakai just, they don't hold the disc very long. They tend to time their cuts really well. So continuation throws come very smoothly and they're able to get rid of the disc and continue to have a flow of offense. It's very tough to guard 
you always got to adjust as a defender to the changing position of the disc. You've always got to be active after your guy releases the disc that he's going to take off. It's just it's it's a lot of work and a lot of thought as a defender. Seven to five, the score. Sakai looking to break for half here. But both offenses have looked good after some initial bumps from double wide. Be interesting to see which which sort of style of offense they come out in at this point. If we see something like another ISO stack, or if they decide to stick with the vert, whether they put the disc up early, or whether they try and work some of the field before they take a later shot. So here's the pull from Sakai. Good deep pull. Loscorn fading back. And he'll catch the pull and center to Thorne. Those two usually catching and centering on every double wide O possession. Sometimes Thorne takes the centering pass and sometimes it's Loscorn. It's Kieran Thomas. Here we see them work in the field before finding a shot they want. Another shot to Loscorn and a nice put from Kevin Christian to make it seven to six here. Beautiful offense from Double Wide got exactly what they wanted. A couple of swings to the continuation deep. That's one of the things you see with this team and Loscorn in particular is just as just as commonly as he is fielding the pull and taking those centering passes is they're willing to rotate around and put cutters behind the disc. You, sometimes you see Thomas behind the disc or De Girolamo, and you see Loscorn downfield, or you see Alex Thorne streaking deep. They're not afraid to rotate around and let different people play in different positions. And that keeps them from being limited, gives them a versatile and fluid offensive attack. Seven to six, the score. This is Ulti World's coverage of the Pro Flight Finale here in Davis, California. Beautiful, sunny, hot day here on the West Coast. And if you purchase the stream, you have an opportunity to get a season of Rise Up, the first and world's only professional instructional video series about Ultimate for 50% off. Check out the Rise Up Ultimate Facebook page for more details. As we watch Austin's double wide get set to pull here, it's again Gibson. And double wide looking to tie this game for the first time. They were in a 3 0 hole to start this game. It's now 7 6. Seattle with the one point lead. And Seattle still up a pair of breaks. Small scuba there, break side throw. It's Burton. Comes in the middle for Castine. Good small ball movement here from Sakai. It's Caldwell. Great nice throw. Nice Io backhand to Kinley. And now Kinley going to throw out into the space on the far side. And Sakai will take half with excellent offense. It's Mark Burton on the far side with the score for Sakai. 8-6, your halftime score here. An Ulti World subscription gets you closer to the players and personalities you care about with game video, in-depth written and video analysis. Uh, he's going to take off deep, but what he does is very simple. Documentary shorts. And we've played Fruit Squad before, and it, it just feels a little bit harder to lose this year. And a whole lot more. To get your subscription or learn more, go to ultiworld.com slash subscribe. We're going to talk about some scores from around the divisions as we get started here in the second half. Double wide coming out on defense here. Kurt Gibson getting set to pull. We're really glad you're with us here today. Let us know if we can do anything to improve your experience or our coverage. You can tweet at us, send us a Facebook message, or comment on the website. And uh, maybe you have college football on in the background, but we're glad you're here watching some of the best competition that you'll see all season here at the Pro Flight Finale. So zone look here early from double wide. Kinley in the middle, four-man cup. 
And nice hammer there from Kinley to move it to the other side of the field. Now this is something you're going to see them use to try and slow down how quickly this offense moves, but it kind of plays into Sockeye's hand, giving them spaces to though do. Oh, so close for Loscorn. Loscorn swinging at everything and just can't get his hand on any of it. Almost had two hand blocks, almost had a layout D just there, and you can see his frustration as he comes off, knowing he was so close. With all of those almost Ds, like I'm pretty sure like that many point three Ds like adds up to one D. Like on the stat sheet, that was a lot of hard work. It just barely missed him. But uh, you spoke to, to the to the quality of teams here, the level of competition we're seeing. The odds that we see semifinalists that are not in attendance here look pretty low in, in every division. This these are the teams that are we're talking about as contenders. The only teams I can really think of, at least in the women's division who aren't in attendance, are traffic and brute squad on the men's side. You you could talk about pony a little bit. We don't know what Sub Zero really brings to the table. We've seen a bit of Jekyll and Hyde performances from them, but otherwise, in the open and open and men's side, these are the teams that could win this thing. Some notable names not here that you think may have deserved a spot. I think in both divisions, uh, particularly in the men's side, I think Johnny Bravo and Pony come. Bravo. Come, come to mind as teams that maybe deserve to be here. But uh, in the new Triple Crown structure, you have to earn your way in. And these are the pro flight teams that got a chance to play at this tournament because they finish at the quarterfinals or higher at last year's club championships. So as we march towards the series here, just weeks away now, it's going to be an exciting weekend of action here. We've already seen some great stuff. So many top names have already lost games. Fury, Revolver, Riot. The list goes on. And as we watch Double Wide's offense working back up the field, Loscorn, good cut, goes up the sideline to Pollock. Pollock and Dozberg, I'm not sure either of these guys is very used to matching someone who can stand up to them nose to nose, but a lot of size down there for those two. LeMasters dishes to Loscorn, and Loscorn is going to throw the hammer. That's going to get easily poached blocked. And so it's Sockeye with another chance to start off a half with some breaks. But they're going to give it right back. Skip Sewell's swing pass doesn't get there, and it's going to be an easy score for Pollock. And so Double Wide gets lucky there. The mistake from Sewell and the quick score. It's now 9-7. to seven. You don't see those kind of plays from Sakai very often. Kasednar turning it over, which, you know, is, is fairly reasonable. The mistake really he makes there, though, is he just kind of stares while Pollock takes off. And while that would have been a tough matchup regardless, even holding position because Pollock's so much taller, uh, you got to turn and play D. You got you to step up and, and try and contain the opportunity because you never know if you might get a mistake right back. Boston Ironside, after a disappointing first round effort against Double Wide, playing much better in the second round. They lead Chicago Machine 9 to 7. The defense starting to convert some breaks. And that's given them a two point cushion in that game. So we'll keep an eye on that. On the women's side, we see Fury up 11-7 on Molly Brown in their second round game, while Ozone and Nemesis, per usual, locked in a tight one. These are two very closely matched teams, and Nemesis is up 10-9 in that game on the women's side. We also have Fury and Capitals taking place, or Ryan and Capitals, excuse me, taking place just behind us. Ryan coming up with a big layout, D, and they're up 9-8 in that one. This is we jump back to this game with Sefton on the sideline, or nearing the sideline, rather. And now a miscommunication between Sefton and Kasednar. So Double Wide going to get a short field to work with here as they look to get back within one. 
Right now the score 9-7, Sockeye leading double wide. Kurt Gibson walking slowly to the disc, and he'll pick up with Castine in coverage. And Kurt will go straight to the end zone, and it's Dalton Smith catching it out in front of the bidding defender. So that's a quick break for double wide, and it's now 9-8. And both of these teams showing an ability to take advantage of mistakes, especially within the, their own half of the field. Cassetna are involved in back-to-back -back short field turns. That one maybe not his fault as he and Sefton were not on the same page on, on that possession, but two straight possessions with short field turns and the next throw is, is a score for double wide. Uh, so at this level, it's, it's very tough to stop a team starting so close to the end zone because the throwers are just so good and the first steps are so explosive but eight to nine here double wide fighting back after going down early down four to one but have pushed their way back into this game and now have a chance to tie it up on this point with a break so we see Jared Wolf talking to his D-line, setting up the matchups, deciding what to do with his defenders like Kirk Gibson, who's been matching up with the top handler, Dalton Smith, and a guy who we've seen match up with some, some of the downfield guys who've been a threat for their opponents. And we'll see how Wolf assigns them on this possession. Gibson lines, winds up the pull. Another big pull from Gibson. This is going to float to just inside the end zone. Good initial defense there from double wide. Here's Castine. And now, good grab just off the ground here. And a big collision here on the sideline as Wallace crashes into Kurt Gibson. I think neither saw each other as they turned a corner and they smacked heads. Head-to-head -head contact here. I do think Wallace may have reached for his nose, so he may have a injury to the face here, but both players seem to be all right. Gibson will take one. Wallace, we expect to as well. We do see some players replacing those two. Mike Caldwell for Sockeye and Roy Orloff for double wide. Jared Wolf on the mark here, Castine with the disc. He gets set to resume play. Nine to eight the score, Sockeye leading double wide. And the disc tapped in. Lennon and Kasednar are working in the middle of the field. Case Dean now out on the break side. Fires one in the traffic, but Caldwell comes down with it. Here's Kinley. Kinley firing it out towards the end zone and into the end zone. So that's a score for Sockeye. Great throw from Kinley to Burton. And Kinley's really been having a great game, Keith. Good quick movement at the handler position and pinpoint throws all game. Kinley, just a guy who understands his strengths and weaknesses, and he, he plays within the system, and he's just such a valuable part of this team as a leader, as, as a central part of the team's energy and relationships with one another. But on the field, he's, he uses his quickness and his, his skills. And in this offense, it's very potent. We see Wallace on the sideline, icing his lip. Looks like they've suffered a cut when they collided with Kurt Gibson. So we'll sit out for the time being. Hopefully he's OK. Well, 
So the score here, 10 to eight. It's Sockeye holding on to this lead since they started the game with three straight breaks to go up three nothing. And the pull is up, floating along the far sideline and coming down into the back of the end zone. Beautiful pull. Alex Thorne gonna separate. And now getting pinned down in their end zone, not a lot of options. Stall now set up, but it's who other than Kieran Thomas getting open and moving the field. Loscorn finds Thorne. Thorne on the far side. Cutters look a little unsure of themselves of how to beat this poach as Thorne rips a backhand to Christian who found his way behind. It's just a great arm throw. And then Christian flips it into the end zone for Tyler DiGirolamo. So it's the young players on double wide getting the team a quick score there. And that's a, actually a pretty important score considering that double wide was pinned back in their end zone with no options to find all, your way out, get a big huck, and then a bit of a cheeky throw there from Christian for the score. Uh, was that a no-look lefty backhand? <laughs> I'm not sure if he was looking or not. I genuinely don't know. But uh, you're right, that was a very strange possession. We saw Alex Thorne make a really smart decision with the with the defender sprinting down on him to start taking off, gets him a lot of steps on his, on his defender and forces Sakai to help cover him. They don't generate a cutoff of that, which was unfortunate, left law score and kind of just standing there babysitting the disc, but they're able to work out. And I don't know if, if after that initial switch, Sakai was then having to switch to try and recover for the rest of the point, or if it was intentionally poaching the lanes. And we saw Christian gets poached, streaks away, and Sakai did keep him to the most difficult part of the field to throw to, but Thorne's just a great thrower and able to, to power that throw into a very difficult space to attack over the head of Dozberg. 10 to nine here, Sockeye leading double wide. You're watching Ulti World's coverage of the Pro Flight Finale here in Davis, California, presented by Spin Ultimate. Goat and Chain Lightning are tied at 10. Some other scores from around the division. Revolver leading ring of fire by three. And keeping an eye on some other stuff. Last we heard, Ironside was leading Machine nine to eight. That game has been tight throughout. So we'll keep you posted and we'll get you some women's scores here shortly as we watch Nate Castine get open on the sideline. Get it into the middle for Caldwell. Caldwell fakes the hammer and dumps it back. Now Castine gonna put it out into space into the end zone. It's a great throw, but good speed from the defender. A better catch from Mark Burton, who's been catching a lot of goals for Sockeye in this game. It's now 11 to nine. Pretty good defense there from Caleb Denicor, but can't get up big enough to make the play. Burton going up strong with two hands. Like he's gonna dunk the thing. But uh, able to pull that one, reel that one in. Difficult catch. You'd like to see your players stepping up like that, especially with the number of injuries that we have for Sockeye. We see a timeout taken here, likely by Double Wide, though we don't have that confirmed from the observers. 11 to nine here. Sockeye holding the edge. Double Wide has been able to make this game close, but never quite able to get over the hump of the early hole they dug. Just an update on Pool A, if you're following along at home. And the, the first round was two upsets. It was Goat taking down Revolver and Ring of Fire taking down Chain Lightning. But now both of those teams with wins see themselves with a deficit in their second round game. So we could come out of this round with all of the teams in Pool A with a one and one record. And the pool really at this point wide open. Follow along with scores. Make sure you're watching on our dedicated tournament page, the Pro Flight Finale, with embedded score reporter pages, Twitter feeds, and of course, our live stream right here. I'm Charlie Eisenhood alongside Keith Rayner, cameraman Adam Shapiro. You know, it's sunny here in Davis, California.
You know, it's funny you talk about what we're seeing in Pool A. On paper, that was the, that's the pool you expect to kind of just, you know, go to seed and Revolver cleans up. And from the get-go, one of the many surprises we've seen to start our Saturday here in Davis, California. Showing the parity that exists in Club Ultimate today. If you're if you're the USAU, you have to be ecstatic that you are seeing such a high level of competition at a, your first time running this premier event. As a fan of Ultimate, regardless of what you think of the Triple Crown Tour, this is exciting. And teams up and down both divisions finding upsets, shock losses, and we've really seen some exciting stuff so far on the day. And with the format, getting every team into the bracket tomorrow, we could have more exciting upsets in bracket play. We will have to see what happens as that pole floats out the back of the end zone. A little more of a breeze now, blowing from left to right, maybe pushing that one out the back. No more than 10 miles per hour, but windier than it was this morning. And I imagine a welcome relief for the players. It's pretty hot down on the field. Thorne checks it in at the brick mark. Natenberg, Driscoll and Thorne cutting to the same place. But Natenberg gets rid of it. It's right back to Thorne. Great defense by Duncan Lynn on Alex Thorne here. You can see it's the same set from double wide every time. If they get into the center and swing to the sideline, they go for that strike cut. And we watch as Will Driscoll throws away a backhand looking for Tyler DiGirolamo in the end zone. And a little too low, a little too zippy. And DiGirolamo can't get there. So Sockeye with a chance to extend their lead. It's hard to overthrow TD but the wind could be playing a factor. Interesting to see if double when Double White comes out with that small ball set, you gotta think that's what they practice against, right? That's what they that's what they play against every day that they meet up and, and go hard at one another. And their defenders are used to having to guard that sort of attack, but Big Huck looking deep, Tyler DiGirolamo in coverage, but a great play from Clark. Clark now flipping out the throw, looking into the end zone, and it's a bobbled catch, but it's a, it's a score for Sakai. It's now 12 to eight. They take a four point lead into the latter part of this game. And Double Wide now has a lot of ground to make up. And as we've seen so far, it's really just been simple execution errors that have been the difference in this game. The throw jar from Driscoll looking for DiGirolamo, just not quite good enough. And it hasn't really been big plays on defense. It's just been taking advantage of mistakes. That, and that, there, there's two things to say about that. For one, we're getting it to the point in the year where, where teams are, are in rhythm. They're used to each other. Their sets are their sets are well known to to their teammates. So they're getting a, a much better feel for each other, and the offenses are getting much cleaner in general. And and we're starting to see that point in the year where we're just getting a turn is an accomplishment, and utilizing each one of them is so crucial to a team's success. But the other element of that is that oftentimes I see errors attributed to mistakes of the offense often called unforced errors. And as a defense, what you really want to do, you know, you love to get blocks, but in a lot of situations, what you really want to do is create a difficult situation for throwers and receivers. You want to make windows small. You want to put pressure on receivers so they're catching contested throws. You want to make people make throws from positions on the field that are difficult to complete. And when those mistakes happen, a lot of times those can really be attributed to strong defense rather than mistakes of offense. The more pressure you put on, the lower you make the offense's percentages of completing a pass. 12-8 the count. DiGirolamo catches it here on the sideline. Lost corn. Now DiGirolamo poached a little bit deep. He's going to the end zone, but it's too strong. Lost corn overthrowing a wide open DiGirolamo. And so now it's Sockeye with a chance to take a big lead here. The 
Fisk on the sideline, and now Sakai looking deep. Great speed. Can he get there? Huge bid, but just out of his hands. Exton Tickcomb almost getting to it. Nearly an incredible play. But instead we'll see them work the other way. All turnovers count the same. Triscoll dumps it back. Now Lost Corn. Good switching from Sockeye. Shutting down deep cuts. Huge bid, and it's a great block on the sideline from Sam Harkness. Kieran Thomas has been, and as I go to talk about that, Seattle punches it in. And I'm sorry, before the scoreboard had a mistake, it was actually 12 to nine. So now it's 13 to nine. Sockeye takes a four point lead. Beautiful D from Sam Harkness on Kieran Thomas. And I was gonna say that Thomas has been really having an excellent day so far, but on that one, just a great effort from Harkness to get there and get in front. There you see what, when pressure can dictate to get to make allow you to make plays. And those impact plays are what give teams momentum. They give D-lines energy. They break other teams. Uh, and you love to get those plays, but it's the pressure they're applying that allows them to, to find opportunities to make those plays. And a great job by Harkness to do so on a big layout that I, I'm excited to get another look at when we wrap up coverage. 13 to nine the score, timeout on the field. See Sakai huddling up. You talked a little about Sockeye's switching. Uh, and earlier we talked a little about their sideline and their energy. I'm not sure there's a team that communicates better in the game of Ultimate than Sockeye. Sockeye's a very talkative team. They relay a lot of information to each other. And it almost makes it, after a while, you start getting the sense that, that you know, they're, they're one, they're one defense instead of seven players playing defense. They're one of the teams that's the best at capturing that identity and expressing it on the field through their play. And a lot of that comes from their high level of communication, allowing them to stay on the same page and understand each other's actions and motives on the field. So lots of exciting action. I talked a little before about Pool A in the men's division. Pool B, just as interesting, double wide, 1-0 heading into this round. Sockeye 0-1. If this game continues the way that it has gone so far, Sockeye and Double Wide will both enter the third round of pool play with 1-1 one -one records. Ironside took a loss to Double Wide, and they're up in their other game. So another, we have another look at maybe all the teams heading into the final round of pool play with 1-1 one -one records. And that's going to make for exciting third round games. And then the crossover, which really doesn't mean anything, it's just an additional game crossing over the uh, one versus one, two versus two, et cetera, in each pool, should get us some looks at, you know, some cross pool matchups that we'll, we're more likely to see tomorrow. Yeah, those, those crossover games won't mean anything at this tournament, but because of them being some of the best teams, it, it could it could be important when it comes to deciding one seeds at, at the club championships. It's a great point, Keith. Those games are essentially club championships games now, just helping suss out the seeding. So we see Anderson try and put up a puck at enough space that Wolf's able to pull it down just outside the end zone. Wolf looking, trying to get rid of it and does. Double wide about five yards out. And there's a call on the field. This is going to come back. Orloff working with just a few yards outside the end zone. Again throws the score and again it's called back. A foul called against Orloff pushing off on the mark. Observers confer. Revolver with a two-point lead on Ring of Fire after Ring got a break. Boston leading Chicago 12 to nine. And so as Double Wide punches it in after the pair of stoppages, scores now 13 to 10. 
and double wide's defense has a lot of work to do. Games to 15 today. Beautiful, sunny, and hot day here in Davis. On the women's side of the division, we're seeing Nemesis able to open up near the end of their game against Ozone. They're up 14 to 11. Fury able to finish off and get their first win of the tournament. I can't believe I'm saying that. 15-10 over Molly Brown. Scandal, the only team in the women's division so far that's really been dominant, winning their first two games pretty handily. And we see behind us Capitals and Riot locked in at a 12-12 battle here. A game that's been tight the whole way through. So lots of excitement here. Can't, can't tell you enough about how well matched we've seen teams are more or less across the board here. Nothing's coming easy to any of these teams. If you're interested in following the mixed division, you can follow our live Twitter feed on the Pro Flight Finale tournament page. Unfortunately, the mixed division had a separate field site, so difficult to get updates from where we stand here at the Davis, UC Davis Fields. Sockeye's offense working it here. Castine getting a stronger wind here from the left to right side of the field. Maybe why Castine holstered that huck, not wanting to put it up and give a jump ball to these tall, athletic double wide defenders. Thirteen ten, your score. Disc gets tapped live. Castine flips it back towards the sideline for Sefton. Wow, nice catch by Sefton. Not a lot of time to react to that. Sefton looking to get rid of it, finds Sednar right back to him. Now he'll swing to the sideline. It's going to be low, and Kurt Gibson and double wide players calling it down. Observers may not have had a great look at it. It was very close from here. It's unusual to see four or so players all saying down at the same time. I I'm not sure. It happened very quickly, so, but that would be the evidence I'd look at. Gibson immediately shooting deep for a wide Max open Cook. Max Cook, and is Cook into the end zone. Mitch Dengler, the observer down there, had no look at it. And then he called it in, but regardless, they punch it in. Seems like there was some confusion about whether or not he was into the end zone. But it's going to be a break for double wide. It's now 13 to 11 as Gibson wastes no time after the decision that that disc was down, runs up, picks it up, and rips the flick to Max Cook, who had about five yards on his defender. Very heady play there. and. A smart play for Cook to just start taking off. As soon as the, as soon as the resolution of that call was made, Cook just was like, all right, I'm leaving. I'll, I'll, I'll see you guys in the end zone. Behind us, we have a great match. It's Riot with a 13-12 lead over the Toronto Capitals. Capitals with a disc on offense. We'll keep you updated. Riot looking to get their first W. I can't, a, a scenario where Riot goes 0-2 is, is going into the third round looking for their first win. I, I don't even know when the last time that would have happened that they've started a tournament 0-2. Wind picking up here and it's definitely affecting teams. We're seeing some zone in that game and we're seeing some more junk sets and some teams holstering hucks. Don't know how long it'll last, but Bit of a breeze showing signs of affecting the teams. May see, in fact, double wide employ that junk set that they've they've run a couple of times. Now that the wind's picked up and may make some of the downfield throws more difficult. And the wind, as you may be able to see 
on the camera here blowing the sideline. It's a tape sideline, not a painted one. And so now the player is having to stand on the sideline just to hold it in place as Sakai receives. I have a feeling that'll probably stop should the disc come near the sideline, which is the only time it would really matter. 13 to 11. Good to see Wallace back on the field after taking that collision earlier with Chris Gibson. Castine. Now we have a foul called. Fair call, Gibson definitely hitting the disc while it was still in Castine's hand. Perhaps thought he was about to try and release it. Not sure the call is worth making though. Disc is live, Caldwell moves it ahead, and all the way up to break side goes Sockeye to punch it in, 14 to 11. Now Sockeye on the doorstep of a victory here over the defending national champions. And it's been a clean game for Sockeye. Some great defense and all around very solid offense. They've only given up a couple of breaks. Three throws just in and out of, in and out of the hands of those players. Yeah, moving the disc so quickly. Stall count probably not even getting past one in any of those situations, if if even reaching one. Field behind us, Seattle Riot is able to punch it in, take a 13 to 12 lead. Caps trying to find the resolve to dig this one out and score a critical upset. They're playing just their second USAU sanction tournament, mostly participating in Canadian action during the regular season, playing the bare minimum amount of tournaments needed to stay in the Triple Crown Tour. But always a threat come the series. Of note, one of the players we mentioned earlier who's been having a great tournament, Mark Lloyd, for Toronto's GOAT, a World Games player, and perhaps GOAT's number one option, uh, is injured and although he was playing through some hobbling, is now taken off his cleats and is icing on the sideline. That could be a blow for the Toronto team. They trail in their game after getting the huge upset over Revolver in the first round as we watch Thorne rip the backhand looking for Mike Nattenberg and he punches it in. Great play from Nattenberg in the end zone bodying up against the defender and then going out into the space to clean it up. 14-12. So Sakai about to step onto the field on offense with a chance to win it. It's a tough ask to, to get three breaks in a row here. Double wide's gonna see if they're up to the challenge. Like it's a Sakai team whose offense has looked mostly pretty clean for the for the day so far. Kasednar talking to his line. We see Sefton, Kinley, Wallace, either Burton or Clark, I'm not sure, Caldwell and Casey. Breeze Leave definitely it. continuing to pick up here. We started the day with no wind at all. And now we have a pretty consistent five mile per hour wind, which is gusting up to maybe 12, 15 miles per hour. You can see some flags moving in the background there. So double wide defense getting set and notably, this is a second string D line for double wide. See a lot of their rookies, younger players out on this line. They did this at the end of their game of their first round game against Ironside as well. So you have to wonder, are they trying to get these guys reps? Are they thinking maybe uh, some youth might help them get a break here? And there's the quick turn. Castine throwing behind and Rory Orloff able to get a piece of it, punch it into the ground. And so he'll pick it up. Now trying to get rid of it, he's going to have to go to the sideline. Castine nearly getting there. 
the wind picked up enough that the deep shot to this to this end zone is going to be really difficult. A missed effort a by Sefton. Great catch in traffic. Now looking to the end zone, and he finds Michael Mathis on the sideline. And so the second string D line gets it done for double wide, and they're within a point. It's 14 to 13. And now we may see that first string come back out. Some pressure now on Seattle. We just heard the soft cap horn go on. So that won't affect this game, but unless it goes to cap. I believe that is the third time now that we've seen an up the line throw from double wide that a player downfield from Sakai attacks and cannot get to, and that leaves them outnumbered downfield. So something to watch. You don't want to get caught in that no man's land where you attack downfield to try and get a D on an up line cut, and you're not in a position to get there, but you're not in a position to guard your guy anymore. It's a, it's a tough decision to make, but you got to weigh the costs and risks very quickly <laughs> to try and make those plays. Around the division, Chain and Goat locked at 12-12. Revolver leading Ring of Fire 13-10. Chicago Machine trailing Ironside 11-14. And here, it's 14-13 Sakai. And Sakai with another chance to win it here. Kurt Gibson getting set here to pull. And it is this first string D line that will try to tie this game up for the very first time. Double wide has trailed since the first point of this game after Sakai jumped out to a 3-0 lead with three quick breaks. And that's really been the difference in this game, which has been very even since that point. So now some momentum for double wide. Let's see if they can continue it here. And the pull is up from Gibson. Good initial coverage from double wide. Big bid. Now coming to the sideline. And now Sockeye putting it out of his space, looking for BJ Sefton. Two defenders in the area. And there's big collision. Unclear whether Sefton would have had a chance at that. It looked like it floated up over his head, but he's down and hurt. Jake Anderson making contact with him as they both went to the spot. And Sefton looks hurt. He's holding his right shin. May have gotten cleated as they battled for position underneath that disc. Looks like Anderson came in and kind of clipped into the legs of Sefton and then lost his legs out in front under him and he grabbed Sefton on his way down and brought them both down. Now I do think that disc floated over their heads but the contact happened so early that there may be an argument that we just can't determine whether or not Sefton could have made a play on the disc. It was a very early set of contact and the disc was still in the air. I expect that the I, I would expect the observers to uphold any foul call here if there's a contest, but I'm not sure what we'll see is Sefton has helped off the field. The Sakai team already riddled with injuries, not looking to take more into the series, especially to some of their veteran leadership like BJ Sefton. Sefton made one of the plays of the year last year at this tournament before it was called the Pro Fight Finale, just called the Labor Day Championships, and had an absolutely monstrous layout grab in the back of the end zone. If you watch the Ulti World Top 10 from the 2012 season, you can see that play. So this will be Sockeye's disc about five yards outside the end zone. It's going to be Mike Caldwell about to check it in with Jake Anderson in coverage. 14-13 to score. If Sockeye scores, they win. Everyone set. The disc tapped in. Caldwell looking. Anderson in the mark. Good dump defense. Stall getting high, and it's going to be a hammer, and it's nice catch in the back of the end zone. Skip Sewell coming down with it. So that's a win for Sakai, 15 to 13. 
double wide goes down after a nice win in the first round against Ironside. And that 3-0 run at the start of the game really was all that Sakai needed as they managed to hold off a couple of rallies from double wide and take the 15-13 win. An Ulti World subscription gets you closer to the players and personalities you care about with game video, in-depth written and video analysis. Uh, he's going to take off deep, but what he does is very simple. Documentary shorts. And we've played Fruit Squad before, and it, it just feels a little bit harder to lose this year. And a whole lot more. To get your subscription or learn more, go to ultiworld.com slash subscribe.